Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Dr. Alex. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here and talk about a, you know, a very um, interesting topic that both um, Lee and myself encounter on a regular basis. Yes, yes, we do. So I um, thought really quickly before we get started, I might uh, just get you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got into vetting and, and why you kind of decided to move into exotics. Yeah, so it's um, so my journey in veterinary medicine really started when I was still a nurse and I was working in a practice that saw a combination of cats and dogs and birds and I noticed um, I, that I was gravitating towards um, birds in, in particular, uh, but other exotic species. And so I've, uh, after finishing my degree, I sort of tried to hone my skills and pursue further, edu further education and, and studying. I, uh, I completed my memberships in, um, in avian medicine and surgery. Uh, and then afterwards, I undertook a residency. Um, I worked with Dr. Bob Donnelly and uh, completed my, my fellowships and became an avian specialist as well. And so, um, and shortly after that, um, we started the unusual pet vets uh, on the Sunshine Coast with the help of uh, Dr. James Barron and Dr. Uh, James Haberfield as well. So, uh, exotics has always been something that's been um, dear to me, you know, been dear to me, and it presents unique challenges on a daily basis. Um, and certainly, in even in exotic medicine, we are in the habit of discovering new ideas and trying to challenge ourselves. So, um, so that's one of the things that, that probably has always sort of attracted me to it. Um, and of course, you know, do not love birds. <laughs> you know, they're quite fascinating and beautiful, and um, you know, and just you know, particularly parrots keep you keep you you know, they just uh, entertaining to no end. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can totally um, empathise with that coming from, you know, I, I worked with dogs for a long time before I moved into parrots and certainly they've kind of really captured my my attention and my passion. So <laughs> that's not to say I don't love dogs. I do love dogs, but <laughs> there is, um, they've got a little something special about them for sure. So yeah. um, you share your home with a couple of birds? Yeah, I do. So I've actually got three um, three troublemakers at home. I've got a blue and gold macaw named Wattle. She's 17, uh, actually 18 now. And I have uh, recently adopted an African grey parrot, which um, has uh, quite fit into the topic, has further destructive behaviour, which we've been ma managing. And I also have a, a blue-fronted Amazon named Alex, which I did not name after myself. <laughs> he did come up the name. <laughs> <laughs> that must be interesting, actually, especially with an African grey in the house. Any any day now that that bird's going to start picking up on Alex and start calling out Alex. It's it's already it's it, but she she doesn't stop. Her name is Madeline, and she does not stop chattering. She's um and she knows how to talk in the voices of the macaw and the Amazon parrot. It's uh, it's yeah, yeah. It's incredible you know is it unsurprisingly their uh, you know their vocal ability is incredible yes i did share my house with a uh, um african gray for about six months when a friend was away and i was looking after her and uh, yeah her, her vocals were very interesting i always felt like i had a whole aviary full of australian native birds in my house <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> my particularly likes the reverse and truck sound. The beep, beep. <laughs> does it very, very well. <laughs> I made the mistake of leaving Spotify on and there was at this time like a McDonald's like alarm jingle and she mm -hmm. picked that up. So I'd wake up to like this weird alarm that was a McDonald's jingle. So <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Excellent. Cool. Well, look, we really appreciate you coming in to talk about this topic because as you know, we've already chatted about it a little bit, it's so complex and there's so much for people to understand. Yeah. Um, but being able to get some information out there so people, people know the best way to kind of approach um, dealing with the issue when it does pop up in their birds because it is unfortunately relatively common in our companion parrots is, you know, I think really important and, and understanding the complexities of the issue as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. Threat of destructive behavior is something that is so commonly encountered in AV and an exotic practice. And it is something that I, I completely agree. You know, we, we really need as many people to be aware of it as much as possible, because I think a lot of the times yeah. um, we find that people don't act as promptly as what we would like them to. And like with anything, earlier intervention um, means you're more likely to get a better outcome. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, cool. So we'll jump right in it. So um, just really quickly, obviously, if you're joining us live today, you are more than welcome to pop your comment, your questions in the comment section. And uh, Dr. Alex and myself will try to answer as many of those as possible within reason. Uh, please do be aware that there are some situations where if you're asking us a question um, and we have a look at that question, it might be a case that we say, look, that really, really needs to be seen to by your avian vet or a behaviour consultant. So there is, obviously, we're live, we're only here with you for 60 minutes, we can't see your birds, we can't ask all of the questions that we would ask during a consultation, you're not filling out our, you know, pre-consult forms that you'd get if you were working with us. So we'll do the very best we can, but it is very generalised information. So you know, just bear with us. And, and if we say get a consult, then it's certainly worth getting a consult. So um, awesome. But otherwise, go ahead, pop your questions down in the comments. We do have a few to get started with. Um, and so my favourite one of the, the three that we got asked in advance was um, from Jaden, and I'm hoping Jaden's here today. I know he comes along to a few of our um, our lives and that. So Jaden said, what are some common features of FDB success stories? <laughs> so um, I love this question because the answer to that for me, and um, I'm sure Alex will expand on this a bit as well, is uh, as far as I'm concerned, the, the most common feature of a success story with further destructive behaviour is a bird that gets seen to immediately. So not going on social media and asking people on social media what you should do about it, but the first sign of further destructive behaviour, call your avian vet up and make the earliest appointment that you can and get your bird in for a full health check and to chat about it. Um, that's going to that's going to give you the highest chance of successfully resolving that behaviour in the long term. Yeah. Alex? Yeah. Yes, certainly um, we find in a lot of situations when we are seeing birds with further destructive behaviour, uh, a lot of the times the behaviour has been going on for months, um, sometimes even years. You know, we, we, I've seen personally seen birds that have been destroying and, um, you know, damaging their, their feathers, um, you know, for you know, sometimes three or more years before they actually see see a vet, and you know they've gone through and exhausted every natural remedy, every single sort of thing they can possibly think of, um, before actually getting the animal assessed. And occasionally, um, you know, and you know because it's, it's sometimes assumed that the behaviour is also um, you know purely psychological, and, and that's not always the case. We actually see uh, certainly, I guess, to give you a broad sort of category, we see. Uh, fair destructive behavior um, occurring for a variety of psychological issues, but also physiological issues, so underlying health problems. And um, some of these underlying health problems, um, you know, they, you know, one of the clinical signs we see manifesting is the fair destructive behavior. So the sooner we actually um, identify the underlying health problem, or if we can identify the health, the health problem, we might be able to, um, you know, target treatment towards that, that health problem and resolve the further destructive behaviour. However, if we do find that it is a psychological problem as well, um, we then can target our approach more, you know, appropriately to that as well. Because, for example, there's no point focusing on a psychological issue if, you know, the bird, for example, has uh, you know, a painful abdomen and it's plugging over as well because it's painful. You can give it all the distractions in the world and all the training, you know, modifications in the world and all the anti-anxiety medications in the world. That won't fix the health problem. And so your further structure behavior will not resolve. So so I guess the real critical message is early, into, early uh, get, see, getting your bird seen early, but also, um, you know, being aware that we need to identify what's actually causing this that's going to be the critical um, aspect of it. 
Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, and that's something that, you know, as a as behaviour consultants, one of the first things we do when clients contact us to say that they've got a bird with feather destructive behaviour is to ask if they've actually seen an avian vet. Because from our perspective, if there is pain or an illness that's contributing, no amount of work that we put in with the client dealing with the behavioural side of things is going to be terribly effective. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, we always first and foremost ask if that client's seen a vet for that behaviour as a starting point as well. So um, the first the first step is that avian vet appointment. Mm -hmm. I'd like to actually share a little story of, um, it's actually quite, quite a unique story because you, probably, you know that it's not nearly as common. I did have a, um, to give you an idea, I guess, of what the effect of pain. We actually had um, uh, Corella while, uh, come, come in a while ago that uh, was destroying its feathers and was also mutilating the skin that was uh, on its feet as well. And for about, since about, it was three years of age, and um, and at about three years of age, it was started on an anti-anxiety medication called haloperidol in the water. And uh, basically, it was continued on that medication for the next 20 years. So I saw this bird when I was, when I was 23 years of age. <laughs> so you won't see, you oh, won't wow. see me. But this is this bird was on haloperidol, 23 years of age. And the owner noticed that the bird, you know, had re reduced its plucking behaviors and was this not damaging its um, damaging its feathers it wasn't destroying its skin but it wasn't as happy it wasn't sort of vocalizing it was kind of you know really sleepy and spending its time you know sedated on a perch and would just kind of come out and you know, you know not, not really interact with its environment um, so I saw this bird and um, and we had a uh, you know we 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 did a, a quite a full workup on it and we did some X-rays and um, you wouldn't believe we actually found that this bird for the last you know probably since it was a chick, very much since it was a chick was suffering from something called metabolic bone disease which has actually caused chronic deformities of the bone and factors of arthritic joints um, and this bird was was destroying its feathers because it was in pain essentially and the heliperidol was not you know it does have a mild sort of um you know and a pain relief effect but mostly it sort of it has sedative and slightly anxiety effects but it was sedating this bird so the bird was in a daze you know not really sort of you know caring what it was what it was doing but it wasn't treating what was going on so when we actually took this bird slowly off hell because after 20 years you get a you know you get a cumulative effect and you got to slowly wean these birds off um, and we yeah. started this bird with some pain relief agents. The bird stopped all destroying its feathers completely, stopped destroying its skin, and it started behaving like what the owner remembered before the heliperidol. It was happy, vocalizing, talking, interacting. It was a different bird. And this was, you know, the client was in disbelief that this was her bird again. So quite an extreme story <laughs> but uh but it shows you sort of some of the um some of the things we see yeah yeah absolutely uh it just breaks your heart too because you know i mean like you said the bird's kind of out of it so it's probably not as aware of the pain but it does break your heart that they've kind of gone that long and and you know mm. it's just it's they must be just in you know kind of chronic pain so that's certainly yeah, like you said, not probably not the most common, you know, and, and to, to be able to get on top of feather destructive behaviour after 20 years is also very uncommon. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a really good example. And I mean, I'm, um, I've am i been working with Dr. Sasha, who also works with you up there at um, UPV on the Sunshine Coast with my own blue and gold McCall because when he was about 10, 11 months old, he started chewing through all of his flight feathers um, mm. and none, no other feathers on his body. So he wasn't, he's not chewing any of his body feathers. It's purely just his primary flight feathers. Um, and with, you know, working with Sasha is, has meant that we've done x-rays and kind of identified some, some deformities that, you know, exist in his wing bones that are contributing to that behaviour. So it's been a process of working on that and finding the right combination of medications to get him to a point where he's pain-free enough not to resort to that behaviour anymore. So still a work yeah. in progress, but it's certainly, you know, we're seeing some improvement, which is what we're looking for. Yeah, and I think uh, I think that's uh, that's probably a good sort of interlink into that. 
um, with feather destructive behavior, because there are so many causes, we do, uh, we, you know, we're trying to figure out which one it is, does require diagnostic investigation. So, so in a lot of cases, at minimum, for most birds, we would be doing, you know, full blood tests to look at sort of what their white blood cells, their red blood cells are doing, doing a biochemistry to see what all their organs were doing as well to make sure there wasn't any underlying dysfunction. And we would do sort of full body x-rays as well. Um, occasionally, we will also screen them for infectious diseases. So we do see, um, uh, you know, there are characteristics of it. We do screen them sometimes for things like beacon feather and avian poliomavirus if we feel it's appropriate. Um, and then certainly we can we do other things as well where we um, do skin biopsies uh, on, on top of that to try and sort of figure out. It depends sort of on the complexity of the issue, but typically we want to sort of rule out um, the health problems before we settle onto a diagnosis of psychological uh, destructive behavior. That's very specific. Um, once we're certain that there's no underlying health problems, then we sort of uh, focus then on, on addressing purely the psychological. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I should add that all of those testing was done prior to kind of also coming to that conclusion that it was probably the, the deformities in his wings as well. So, um, yes, absolutely. And I think sometimes people are a little bit, I guess, um, you know, worried about the cost of doing all of those di diagnostics mm -hmm. and wondering if they're, if they're necessary. And, you know, I think they are absolutely necessary because you've got to rule out all of those things because if you don't rule them out and you just move on to treating it as a, like you said, a psychological behaviour, then um, you may still have that underlying condition just driving the behaviour. Yeah. And we can, you know, you're one, you'll either get uh, no resolution of signs or you end up like that. Corella story, I told you, 20 years of, <laughs> of something that's been not really the most effective treatment or treatment. Yes. Before. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Just kind of hiding the symptoms rather than treating the actual underlying cause, which is what we don't want to do that. We don't want to slap a band aid on it either. So. And we have to remember our, our parrots, they are, you know, they're with us. They're not, um, you know, they do become, they're part of the family and they're with us, you know, for decades, really. In a lot of situations so so uh i think uh, we in the past we've all often undervalued the importance of psychological and emotional health in birds um and just yeah. focus on the um on the physiological and the physical and that's in itself um i think as probably has been a bit of a disservice to our parrots uh, in general so there's a there's a i think working together with you know, with parrot life and, and you know, trainers like yourself, I think we have, uh, you know, the most sort of holistic approach to sort of what we're doing, where we're, where we're tackling both from, you know, from the, from a, a psychological and from the medical perspectives, which is, I think, very much the future of how to manage these sort of issues. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. Awesome. Uh, so we've got a couple of other questions here and, and funnily enough, they're actually are uh, very similar. So uh, Mike has said that he's got a Hans McCaw hen that plucks her chicks. Um, any thoughts on possible causes? And then we got a comment previously on one of the posts on the Facebook page that asked a very similar question. Uh, why do lorikeet parents over pluck their baby's feathers? How do I change or prevent this? So those are kind of um, very much the same questions. So <laughs> um, I it's not necessarily going to be the same reason, though. Mm -hmm. It is. It, it is. Um, you know, we, we do see parent birds destroying or removing feathers from their chicks on a regular basis. It, it is something that um, you know, I guess, universally hap happens sort of in the captive setting as opposed to sort of naturally. Um, uh, there are a number of proposed reasons. No one one hundred percent knows why you know these these happen, but we have a number of proposed reasons of why they seem to occur. Um, certainly, we see higher um, underlying or ex external stresses being contributing. So, if there is yeah. insecure, you know, if the, if the aviary is less secure, if it's uh, in an environment that the bird normally sort of wouldn't be in a nesting situation. You know, a lot of birds, um, particularly lorikeets, they might, so even though they're quite social birds, they'll still sort of create nests quite far away from other individuals. They're not sort of like our budgies, uh, which kind of congregate 
massive sort of colony type nests. But um, uh, but uh, but essentially they'll come, they'll they'll create a nest that's away. So sometimes the external threats of having other birds can can cause um, can create issues um, and cause the birds to be you know to manifest stress, which then they ex exert by essentially plucking their babies. Uh, we also see that occasionally birds that have been previous that have that seems to be a nurture aspect to it. So if the baby, if the, if the parent bird was plucked as a baby bird by its parents, it seems to be more likely to then exhibit that behavior to, you know, uh, as well. Um, and and I guess there's there's no there's there's no sort of easy solution for it. You can uh, certainly yeah. from the environmental stressor aspect, you can reduce the environmental stresses. Um, try to sort of adjust sort of their reserve. In a lot of situations, it's unrealistic for most people that are breeding birds. Um, they their setups to just have hundreds of birds in a lot of cases, and so they yeah. um, become very difficult. But if you was in a small individualized setting, it's a bit easier. Um, but certainly, we find that if you have a, a parent bird that is destroying or removing feathers from its chicks, it's probably an indicator that if you're focusing purely on the breeding aspect, that you probably shouldn't be continuing breeding those parent birds because it may, just as a precaution that we are creating this nurture effect and passing on those um, those learned behaviors. I think I, I, I 100% agree. Yeah. yeah. Have you got anything else to add to that, Lee, from your experience? <laughs> Look, I, you know, like you said, I think it's probably comes down to um, external stresses, like you said, and that, you know, that might be the setup of the nesting site, other birds being nearby, it may be an issue with nutrition. So um, mm. it might be causing stress within the parent birds. Um, it may be that those birds aren't coping with the number of chicks that they're raising. Um, mm. So you might also look at things like, you know, maybe if they're raising three or four chicks, that's just too many for that, that set of parents. Mm. Uh, but I also strongly agree that um, we kind of want to break that cycle as well, that there's probably, you know, to an extent, like you said, this this kind of learnt part to that behaviour where if a parent bird has been plucked as a chick, there's the chance that that's kind of what they feel is normal behaviour and they're more likely to engage in it as well. And I think especially because we're seeing so many further destructive issues within the captive companion parrot, parrot world that we should be moving towards trying to avoid breeding birds that have a history of um, further destructive behaviour as well. Yeah, I think that's a that's, that's a very very good point. I think that's excellent. Um, a lot of times we in the bird um, community, a lot of what we are breeding for is what we call phenotypic traits or uh, external physical characteristics and how pretty the animal is or you know how big its head is or things like that. And we often forget about the temperament side of breeding. And I think that's something that we probably need to reevaluate more to an aspect as well, um, because breeding for temperament. We are seeing, you know, as a, I, I use the example sort of from from dogs and cats because we, you know, we don't have as much sort of on, on birds on this aspect. But we certainly know with dogs, you know, with um, you know, if the um, if the bitch is more sort of aggressive or anxious when she's raising pups, then the pups are more likely to develop you know, the same sort of characteristics as well. Um, you know, wild birds are sort of certainly um, different. There is no reason for us to not um, presume that that can happen as well in them. Yes, yes. If people are interested in that, they can look up epigenetics and there's some really interesting information on epigenetics and how environments can turn on and off particular genes and how that affects behaviour. And so even little things like where the parents are at, like, when they're, you know, producing an egg or raising a baby is likely making a big difference to that that baby's yeah. long-term mental health as well. And yeah. like you said, I also draw comparisons to the dog world where, you know, when we're breeding for pet homes, people are trying to breed dogs that have good temperaments. We're breeding for temperament, not just for looks. And that's certainly yeah. something that we're not quite, we've not quite got to with birds yet. We don't quite think in those terms yet and you know yeah. I think we we should start moving towards that it'd be great to see breeders yeah. moving towards breeding for temperament in parrots so yeah and we'll take a while because the jet you know generationally you know cats and dogs really they can start you know breeding fairly quickly and a lot of our larger parrot species 
you know, we're waiting three, four years, sometimes longer, before we really can um, start sort of getting the next generation. So, yeah, so it takes a long time to build, bridge that generational gap as well. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, no, yeah, very, 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 it's a very good question. Yeah, <laughs> it is a very good question. And yeah, it's a very interesting topic. Like I said, epigenetics is kind of cool. And like if you're interested in behavior and and how stress and environment can affect behavior, then looking up epigenetics and, and having a read up on that is really interesting. Awesome. Uh, so Mike had another question. He said, uh, I think a lot of people are concerned about the cost of doing the basic investigative tests. Can you give me an idea of what the basic test cost would likely be when starting to investigate this? Um, I will, I'm just, I'll let Alex answer this in a second, but I will just add that the longer we put these things off, the more expensive it's likely to be. And it's the same with any behavior. Like when a client comes to me and they're like, my bird is biting, it's been biting for a week. I, you know, we can make a lot of progress on that in one session. If someone comes to me and my, says my bird's been biting me for 10 years, we're going to need more sessions. So it's actually going to get more expensive the longer you wait. So although the initial costs can be a little bit scary, the likelihood is that in the long run, you're saving money if you do it nice and early. So Alex, I'll, I'll let you. <laughs> um, it is it is very hard to give you sort of an overall um, cost because the costs are going to vary based on the clinic, the location you're in, and even the country that you're in as well. Um, so, so, and and in terms of, I guess, um, you know, what we are going to select initially, um, you know, it, it will, there will be there'll be some some level of cost involved in it, but that's simply because we physically need to do the diagnostic tests to sort of work up the problem. Um, I, as I, said, I don't like to sort of get into the specifics sort of of the cost because I think um, without sort of the um, you know evaluating down the line um, you know problem and looking at the burden you can't you can't formulate a basic plan. In saying that, I I, can, I, I also completely agree with, with with Lee. So we find that um, the sooner you tackle these problems, the lower your overall long term costs are going to be. You know if you have a Let's say you have an eclectus parrot with a feather destructive behavior. Now, a bird that could be there for the next 40 years, and you have, um, you know, you have decided to go towards medicating with an anti-anxiety medication, uh, not knowing whether it's effective or not. If you, you know, you're going to get progressive repeats, whatever you're going to have, you're going to have repeat visits over a long-term period of time. That's going to add up probably more than what the initial diagnostic test would have cost, cost you in the short term. So you, you have to think of the long-term gain in this situation mm. and, and most cases. So yes, the initial cost may be substantial, but if we get, if we figure out the underlying problem and we tackle it and we start appropriately managing it or treating it, if it's an underlying health issue, then your long-term costs are going to be actually low or you may not need to, you know, it requires sort of huge amounts of ongoing medications or even as many revisits as what you would expect. So, um, so yeah, uh, I think, um, I think, yeah, initial costs, there is going to be some, some level of cost, but um, think of it as a long-term gain as opposed to short-term initial um, costs. Yeah. And of course, excellent. And of course, you're, you're talking about sort of your your family pet, and, your, and, and you know it's not it's not just you know a random bird. This is some someone that's obviously going to be very special to you, and you you want them to be around for a while. They become part of the family. You know, I see many of these birds um, you know, go through generations where they pass them from uh, from the father to the son. So they're they're very very special individuals. So um, you yeah. want to do that for them as well. And you want them to have uh, be physically healthy, but also as an emotionally and psychologically healthy too for their whole life. Like you would expect, you know, your son or your daughter to be. You know, you don't want them to be, you know, oh, you know, okay, and then they all kind of get the types of problems. But you, know, you want them to be healthy for their whole life. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, I agree. Awesome. So we've got another question here from Jillian. Jillian said, do you always see feather destructive behavior? So um, one of her birds chews his feathers, but she's never seen him do it. Um, he has been seen by an avian vet and checked for medical issues. Um, uh, I, I've certainly met birds that will engage in feather destructive behavior when people aren't around. So um, the weather behavior primarily happens when no one's there, when someone's gone out or even at night time in some cases. I've, I've certainly seen birds that do most of their destructive behavior overnight. 
So certainly I don't think you are always going to see the behavior happening. Yeah, I agree completely. Yeah, I think that's that's the thing. We, we often use it as one of our little question questions that we ask is, you know, do you actually observe the feather structure behavior? Because it can give us a clue of why it might be happening um, as well. You know, particularly when we see some birds that are, um, you know, that might have separation related anxiety um, or, or anxious issues. They're more likely to destroy their feathers when they're in an active situation because away from their flock mate, aka human. <laughs> um, you yeah. know, so, so that's, that's really, really important. Um, the other aspect is, I guess, um, you know, as I said, uh, feather destructive behavior also comes in, you know, different facets as well. So different severities. Um, it's most always, though, um, progressive in nature, too. So you might find that initially the behavior is occurring during specific time periods, and then it slowly starts manifesting and changing where it becomes more frequent and then all of a sudden it's occurring all the time or in front of people as well. So that's the, that's important to remember too. Yes, yeah, I worked with an African grey last year who um, the, the, all of the destructive behaviour was happening when a particular person in the house was not present, so they were going out of the house and that you know, gave us a really clear idea of what the potential triggers for that behaviour were and, and allowed us to kind of make changes to try and assist that assist that bird in, in you know feeling more confident and comfortable when that person wasn't present so um, you're not always going to see it and and that's you know part of our diagnostic tools um, absolutely to to work out what might be triggering that behavior mm -hmm. and um I, I know lee and i use the abcs <laughs> all the time of behavior so um so uh, so what we what what the abcs are is we look at what's called the antecedent what um, precedes a particular behavior with environmental factors before behavior, the physical behavior itself. So in this case, it might be feather structure behavior, um, and then the consequence. So what the bird gets out of it, you know. So so as example, if the you know the bird, um, you know, let's say it's uh, an anxiety sort of related. Or let's use screaming as an example. Uh, if the bird sort of screams and the uh, and the you know and immediately the person comes in and gives it attention that you know, reinforces that behavior essentially so we sort of look at we look at it as a, as a whole approach it's a little bit you know within the hours to you know going through the whole sort of aspect is a bit you know we're a little limited but essentially we use that to, to help us determine what's going on yes yeah so we often say to our clients every every behavior serves a function so um and um, good old, our, the lovely Susan Friedman, who is one of our heroes, uh, <laughs> she says, WTF, what's the function? So, um, and that's certainly something that we're already always looking at because there's always, there's always a, you know, a consequence that's driving that behavior for the animal. Mm -hmm. um, yes, absolutely. Asking those questions and finding out when the bird's doing it and uh, can really help answer that. There is a class of, um, of behaviors that don't seem to serve a function. Um, for those that are sort of interested, they are called the stereotypies. Um, and they're usually the end stage manifestations of, um, of abnormal behaviors that have kind of lost the signals of what's going on. They're sort of things that have been left to go on for too long. And so a lot of these behaviors no longer serve a purpose. You know, we had um, a few years back, I had a a lorikeet that had quite severe feather destructive behavior, um, but at the same time it had, you know, it would hold onto the bars and flick its leg backwards, you know, repeatedly, and it um, and that flicking leg backwards was not a functional sort of behavior of any sort of purpose. It just sort of something that, that developed, and we and we could never really get rid of that stereotypical behavior um, because it's been so ingrained over the many years of that issue. Well, um, so we want yes. uh, we want to avoid getting to that, that situation. That point, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. People, and I think it, for for most people, probably um, for them to picture it is that it's the the lion or the tiger at the zoo that just paces backwards and forwards mm -hmm. in the same spot all day long. That's a that's a really common one. It's it's not as common these days in zoos because they do a really good job of enriching their animals' um, lives. Um, um, bar chewing. Bar um, um, chewing by you know can sometimes be also related to stereotypy. Occasionally, um, 
um, we do see, um, you know, and, and certainly we see also some of the pacing backwards and forwards behaviors develop as well too. That can be yes. Yes, yeah, I've certainly seen that with birds that are, are kind of stuck in very small cages and, and don't get a lot of time out and don't send, seem to have a lot of interaction with anything. So, yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right, so we've got another question from Cindy. She said she's got a green wing that chews up the tiny down feathers. She's had a workup with an avian vet. She gave her an implant. My question is, if she's shredding, shredding the down feather, will she go on to pluck? I would have an extra question here and it would be, is she pulling the down feathers out and then shredding them or are they falling out naturally and she's just playing with them? So um, I'm not sure if you, if Cindy's able to maybe clarify a little bit on like when she's, when she's getting access to those down feathers, is she actually physically pulling those feathers out to shred them or is she shredding them when they're on her body? And that, that little bit of extra information, um, would be really really helpful but I mean let's assume that she is pulling them out or shredding them on her body um, would then that I guess mean that she's at more risk of going on to pluck hard to say mm -hmm. it, yeah it's it's it's, un, it's unpredictable uh, I said in in my experience a lot of a lot of feather structure behaviors can't can be progressive if you leave them in the same, you know, and, and you know, if you leave them close to the same sort of factors that are causing it. You know, if the, let's talk about, um, you know, the, if the stressor is persistent, then we can expect that the level of anxiety and stress the bird feels is going to increase, which, you know, lo logically will cause the behavior to worsen. Um, it doesn't, you know, not everyone, but they don't all follow the same rules, obviously. You know, it's just like, um, I like to always draw to the human side of things, you know, um, not, you know, not every, you know, human that has emotional or depressed, that will have emotional issues that have depression will progress to, you know, harming themselves or anything like that. But it happens in a few. So, um, and, and the same thing with birds. It's, it's, it's so complex that we can't always predict it, but we prefer to, you know, we, we like the sort of, um minimize the chance of it progressing yes yeah that's it it's i guess it's best to assume if they're engaging in some kind of feather destructive behavior that that might escalate um at any time and when they've you know and we talked about this just before we got started there's always this risk with birds that um have engaged in feather destruction in the past that they go back to that behavior given particular stresses in their life so you might resolve it to a certain extent, or you might resolve it entirely, but down the track, they might then pick that behavior back up again um, when they get particularly stressed about something. So it's, I think it's always a good idea to, to treat it like it is, you know, um, going to get worse. Yeah. And I think that's actually, you know, it's good to sort of link to the fact that um, probably Lee and myself um, end up in situations where people come to us and they want you know a quick fix for these issues and um, in a lot of situations um, you know a quick fix isn't possible i would say in the majority of cases a quick fix isn't possible um, you know if we find a very specific health problem we treat the problem sometimes that resolves the whole thing but in a lot of cases these issues are um, you know they're they're complex they um they are ingrained and if, and when they're psychological we know that the psychology of the bird does not change necessarily. You know, it's like asking, you know, a, a human, you know, you're, you're depressed. You know, why don't you get better immediately? You know, after you see the psychologist, <laughs> something like that. It, it, it just doesn't happen. You know, it, these these are these are psychological, emotional, complex problems that um, that we you know we can't ask the bird about, but when you you know they are usually lifelong. And as Lee mentioned, we do have birds that. Um, that we manage and that can completely grow back feathers and they'll look perfect and then if there is a particular sort of stressor that comes back into you know in, in into their life or something or a new stressor which they may have not equipped in very well um, because we typically try to establish a very a very um, consistent routine for a lot of these guys to make sure they're not getting stressed 
um, then they can literally worsen and remove feathers overnight, which can be quite distressing for a lot of people. You know, they have their little, they have their beautiful little, you know, bird and it's grown all its feathers back and then they wake up in the morning and it's back to sort of square one. Um, you know, it, it is something that requires uh, ongoing sort of management. But once you have sort of some of the tools, you can continue doing what's required and you can get assistance from, you know, from, from us to be able to sort of um, manage the problem appropriately. And if something new develops and we start sort of reevaluating why that's happening and seeing what we can do about it as well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's thinking of it in the same way that we might think about, you know, humans that smoke and then they give up smoking. But, you know, often that's used as a coping mechanism. People smoke when they get stressed. And so when they quit, you know, they can often stay off, you know, for years, but then under a certain amount of pressure, they may revert back to that behaviour to help themselves mm -hmm. cope. And I think that's something to keep in mind is that, you know, that sort of that sort of thing is normal, not just in parrots, but in, in humans and all animals yeah. as well. But um, behavior can revert if we're put under enough pressure. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, de de definitely, definitely. Yeah, excellent. All right. So Rebecca had another question. Hers was regarding medication. So I'll just let. Obviously, I don't. I don't deal with meds. I'm not a vet. So I'll just let you answer this one. But yeah. her, the question was, what is your recommended SSRI for FDB, and what do you look for when choosing the right medications? Um, so SSRIs, um, uh, we personally, is a, there, there are some studies that have looked sort of at the use of SSRIs in, um, in parrots and, uh, and some of them do show that they appear to have some level of efficacy, at least initially, um, compared to sort of placebo. Um, they do appear to temporarily reduce the behavior. We've, we've found in a lot of cases when they do work, um, there's a high incidence of relapse, uh, oh, sorry, not relapse, reversion to the same behavior, behavior even while on the medication. Um, I typically use most of the pharmacological agents as um, last resorts. This is, and this might be variable from different avian specialists, but in a lot of cases, I find that a lot of the um, pharmacological agents that we use for um, for managing these problems are either not effective, um, are minimally effective, or they, um, you know, or they mask potential sort of problems or create situations where the client um, develops an expectation that I want medication for, um, you know, for, for my to manage this. And this is something we see. Well, back a long time when I worked with dogs, this is something that routinely would happen in dogs. You know, kind of comes in, doesn't we know is not interested in one of fine behavior, wants a drug to fix things. So, um, so I, I, I typically want a very established, well behavior management plan. Um, you know, I want sort of things to be just before I use those drugs. And it, and if and if I find that um, that we you know we're reaching a point where we need to sort of use them, then certainly you know I'll use them. And in terms of sort of the ones that I would typically use. Um, I've used uh, clomipramine and fluoxetine. Um, uh, fluoxetine is a different class of drug, of course, but I use clomipramine typically as one of the, um, the agents. Um, and I, um, you know, to try to try and sort of address it. But as in my, my overall sort of success with just using pharmacological intervention without taking anything else into consideration is very poor. So, um, so without the underlying factors, I, yeah, it's, something I, I'm, I'm very, I, I hate to say negative, but, but I'm very, I'm, I'm, I'm not much of a fan of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I guess, probably one of the, like, one of the things that I see with um, any animal that goes on to a behavior medication is the um, misunderstanding from the the owner's point of view that that's, that's it, that you give that and that's supposed to fix it. But realistically, all behaviour medication also requires behaviour intervention protocols and they really go hand in hand. So if you just go home with that medication and give it to your bird, but you're not then working with someone on a behaviour modification plan, the, like, the, the effectiveness of that is going to be significantly reduced. Um, whereas, yeah, if you're actually combining that with that behavior modification plan, there's a much higher chance that that's going to be successful. It's just like, again, humans, 
you know, you don't go to your psychologist or your psychiatrist and they're just like, here's some meds and off you go. They go, we're also going to do this other work and you need to see this, you know, therapist or counsellor to work on behaviour modification as well. And and probably a good time to mention, I think this is probably something that um, Lee and I also talked before at the start, is is the use of hormonal therapy (laughs) for hormonal driven um, fair destructive behaviour. I think in a lot of cases, that's another um that's an, another treatment modality that's often abused by a lot of um, veterinarians um uh, and it's it's often once again it fits into that quick fix sort of category uh, my bird is hormonal um give me something to stop it from being hormonal you know ho- hormonal and to start you know potentially stop the destructive, destructive behavior you know and we give them an implant sort of thing um i think without that initial sort of setup without the behavior modification um, your hormonal therapy once again is going to be um, either less effective or not effective in sort of one there, there are a few select cases i'll admit where i have used um, hormonal therapy and had had some almost amazing results you know and that happens that's going to be the case for any any situation but in a lot of instances you have to you have to look at the whole picture yeah, I agree. And I've certainly seen that, you know, on a few occasions where it's been jumped to as like a first a first intervention really quickly and um, and then not seeing any success for the for the client as well. And so, you know, uh, it's certainly become, you know, the the dominance of the parrot world, the the word hormones. So <laughs> it, it gets thrown around a lot for a lot of different things. And um, unfortunately, I think it really um, creates this roadblock to getting appropriate and proper help because it also usually comes with the line that, oh, it's just hormones, it's going to happen, you just have to put up with it and that's not the case at all and, and that doesn't mean that going to your vet and getting a hormone implant is the way to stop that either. It's actually there are lots of different interventions that we can utilise if breeding hormones are even a part of the, the story right. and, and sometimes they really aren't. So Yeah, that, that's completely right, yeah. Yeah, so I hope Cindy actually asked, should should the hormone implants be used for this? And so you kind of jumped into that before we'd even got to that question. So that, that, that answers the question. I mean, maybe, but it depends on um, a lot of other, you know, diagnostics and making sure that we're absolutely sure that is a contributing yeah. factor to that. And it should still be done with, like Alex said, some kind of behaviour intervention as well. Yeah. And, and as I said, hormone, hormonal implants, they can be lifesavers. You know, they, they really can make a big difference. We do have some birds that with behavioral modification, with sort of the adjustments, they simply don't switch, you know, switch off. They don't sort of change. And, and in that absence, have that little sort of extra sort of, you know, as I say, that arrow in your quiver, which we use to sort of target that approach. That can make a big difference and also sometimes we it can also facilitate training so we see sometimes but to give you an example we see some birds that might be more um, aggressive during um, you know particularly during the reproductive periods of the year the parts of the year where they're more reproductively active and sometimes dampening down the effects of the hormones actually facilitates training methods so if we use them you know in the right situations and we use them correctly we can enhance the effect of behavioral training and get the best possible outcomes yes yeah i agree absolutely sometimes birds are so focused on uh <laughs> making babies with someone that the you know training is just it's not even important to them and no amount of food is important to them or any kind of reinforcer but access to their perceived mate so <laughs> Yeah, which can make training incredibly difficult. Yeah. Birds are very horny little creatures, that's for sure. (laughs) Absolutely. I worked with this lovely cockatiels yesterday and they're just very sweet, but um, this couple has gone and got a a, a second cockatiel. I think it was a girl and it's a boy and the poor, you know, he's he's doing all of the, you know, cockatiel stuff, singing his songs and um, being very, uh, yes, pushy with the females. So they can certainly, yes, have have a one track mind sometimes. So, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> um, Gillian, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, no, you go ahead, Liz. Let's go to the next question. Uh, 
Oh. Yeah, I was, so Gillian asks, it's like a habit, now, like nail biting in humans. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think probably a common example or similarity would be something like people who pick at their eyebrows when they get a bit stressed and, and they actually pull the eyebrows out because it can give that kind of same physiological response in the body when they pull that um that little eyebrow hair out so yes yeah, certainly it can be it can be like a habit um but i think sometimes and, and this is something we spoke about before we got started as well i think sometimes it's not always habitual there are you know mm. other potential underlying things that the that the feather destructive behavior actually sets off so maybe the feather destructive behavior started because the bird was injured or sick or something else was going on and we get on top of that but then the behavior keeps going and Alex was saying that they've certainly seen some um you know some situations where the follicles are damaged and that there might be a level of you know itchiness or some kind of physiological response to the plucking that's now driving that behavior so yeah yeah Alex, uh, yeah yeah we certainly um uh, in in the early stages it's not habitual it's um you know mat it's a you know an initial sort of stressor and they cope with it and so it's not immediately habitual but the longer it persists the more likely it's to become habitual um there is the effects of the endorphin system so like what legal tension where people pluck it out they get that oh, you know we know that there's that endorphin release that at least happens in humans and and that's perceived to be a possibility also in birds as well um unfortunately agents which have focused on blocking some of these endorphin pathways have produced disappointing results in a lot of cases by themselves, just due to the complexity of the issues. Um, and certainly um, we find that, I guess with the habitual, you know, with, with sort of focusing on, on the actual um, habit itself and, how t and the amount of time it takes to develop, um, we find that certainly in, intervening sooner is going to give you sort of the, the better results. But I guess linking sort of um, to, you know, differentiating whether it's a habit or a change that has happened can be a little bit challenging. So as Lee mentioned, I've, I've been doing some um, more, you know, we, we, we did a lot more biopsies of the affected skin these days to have a look at what's going on with these feather follicles. And in a, in a lot of these um, cases, we are seeing some inflammatory cells, so cells that come in there and they, and they cause inflammation, which can lead to itching. Um, and we are also see, and what I've been seeing sort of more recently is the actual feather follicle itself is no longer a normal structure. So instead of having its normal sort of structure that we expect for it, when we look at it, uh, I know, uh, microscopically, it, it's just this disorganized uh, bundle of, um, of keratin, which is the outer, you know, what the feather is made out of. Um, majority of it's made out of so um, and that in itself as said, while we don't have definitive sort of evidence um, causes the feather to not erupt properly causes it to itch um, and so we you know it's possible that we've seen birds that are actually manifesting um, you know with these chronic itching signs due to damage the, due to the damage they've caused to the feathers rather than it actually being a habit the bird is just responding to the fact that it's got very itchy you know skin yeah 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 so that's yeah there's again so so complex so many things to look at so <laughs> you yeah. can't just assume that it's a habit because the birds practiced it for a long time and maybe other underlying physiological things going on that's also driving that there as well yeah definitely I think that's important to point out because I guess, and like you said, Alex, you've recently taken on this African grey who has a history of further destructive behaviour. Mm. So, you know, that does happen really commonly. People take birds into their home and they've come from a situation where they have been destroying their feathers and they just kind of assume, oh, this is a habit now. So there's not much I can do, but I think it's super important if you're taking on a bird that has further destructive behaviour tendencies. And, and like that Corella you were talking about, it still should go to the vet, even if it's been doing it for 5, 10, 15 years, still take that bird to your avian vet because there may be something there that, you know, we can, that, that can be done to help that bird live a better life and to have less chronic issues. So, Yeah, definitely. I completely agree. I, I said the, um, the, the duration of the behaviour certainly shouldn't um, distract you from wanting to seek help for it. I think we can all sort of fall into a bit of a 
and have it saying, oh, you know, it's always done it. So let's let it always do it, you know? And I think it's important we don't, we don't sort of fall into that sort of pitfall. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Mike came back with another question. Uh, so he was the one that had the Hans McCorhan that was um, doing some further destructive behavior on chicks. So he said he heard recently from another parrot breeder that a lack of protein could be the reason for parent birds plucking their chicks to get more protein. From a clinical view, do you think that there is any truth behind this line of thinking? Is there particular vitamins or minerals that are important for feather growth? And may assist when molting or regrowing feathers? I think um, Lee probably touched on this a, a bit sort of earlier on. So there are nutritional um, deficiencies that can, um, you know, can act sort of as stressors, um, I guess, you know, because it's you know, nutritional deficiency is a stressor, uh, which can, you know, you know, we, once again, it's, it's a bit of a link sort of to make, but it's certainly there's, a, you know, it, there, there is some aspect that nutritional deficiency is conversation out of normal behaviors. Um, in terms of your questions of vitamins and supplements, I think um, you, there's no vitamin or supplement that's going to, you know, fix feather structure behavior. That's, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's not, it's not how it works. Um, but certainly we, uh, we find that um, birds that are on predominantly, for example, seed diets um, are much more prone to nutritional deficiencies. Most of the seed, seed is deficient in your know, vitamin A, D, E, and K, and certainly even phosphates are quite low. Um, vitamin A is, is one of the most important vitamins for the formation and of keratin. So deficiencies in that could cause um, feather and skin abnormalities theoretically. Uh, um, but uh, you know, we, it's, it usually takes a substantial amount of a deficiency before you see something manifesting. Um, you know, we, we, and that's what we typically find the, the body and the birds sort of physiology is very adept to adapting to deficiency to mild deficiencies which is why we see birds surviving 50 years for you know 50 years with just a seed diet for example it's not that you know the diet that and these birds are chronically deficient we have uh, numerous underlying health problems but they're surviving because physiologically they can still survive um so so the short answer to your question is um no there there isn't any supplemental minerals mineral vitamin supplement that unfortunately will be um will help with that particular issue i think um providing uh we do have access now sort of to the breeder pellets which have a higher sort of uh, protein and fat content um you can sell them to the breeding birds feed a slightly sort of high fat and supplement a little bit a bit of seed which is not going to cause that harm and then certainly you have it you know, depends on the species of course but presuming the greater the species you're talking about um uh, and then vegetables are um uh, you know a variety of vegetables or chop mixes are going to be helpful to um to ensure they gain a variety of nutrients fiber um phytonutrients as well um i'm i'm you know i'm a firm believe you know believe now of more of a varied diet as opposed to locking into one specific category yeah yeah and i do know um mike uh does feed a really nice fairy diet full of lots of good nutrients to his birds so i'm yeah. sure it's um probably not related to a nutritional deficiency with regards to his bird as a like a very aside kind of note um a lot of the conspecific feather destructive behavior that i've worked with has been in harm's macaws so for mm -hmm. some reason i've, I've seen a few harm's macaws that seem to be more inclined to um, destroy feathers on their friends than on themselves. <laughs> yeah. And it is, uh, uh, you know, we do see, we see a lot of conspecific um, feather destructive behavior in the Hans. We see it sort of in the Indian ring necks, sort of some, uh, and Alexandria, some of the Asiatic species, the, um, the collector's parrots too. We see it sort of relatively sort of often as well. Um, uh, you know, there appears to be some, some, species of birds tend to be more predisposed to these um, issues. There doesn't appear to be a specific pattern as to, you know, why, you know, are they, you know, purely hand read, you know, we, we, we've some seen, we've seen it in birds, certainly hand read birds seem to have a higher incidence, but, um, you know, it, it, there's no clear um, delineating feature which tells us 
why they're more predisposed to it. Um, you know, Quaker parrots also, um, you know, generally sort of prone to it, prone to those these sorts of things as well. Um, but yeah, we don't have a clear idea of sort of, a, of of why you know they're more predisposed than other species. Yeah, yeah. I think your note about um, environmental factors, especially around the nest site, mm -hmm. and that is probably you know mm -hmm. something that. We don't, I guess we probably don't have quite enough information or we don't take species specific needs into account as much as we should do when we're looking at parrots and breeding. But realistically, you know, every species has, you know, a very different and, and specific setup that they kind of look for. And it's very possible that we're just not providing what is natural enough for them. And that's, you know, a contributing factor to it. So. Um, and, you know, like you said, we are kind of limited because we've got, you know, breeding setups and they're in aviaries and you might not be able to kind of um, adjust that in a way that's mm -hmm. you know, more natural for them. So That's actually actually a very good point. Like we refer to the collector's parrot as an example. In the natural situation, you're going to have the, uh, the hen bird spending its time within essentially you know, 100% of its time within the nest uh, nest box and it will have multiple males you know coming in and feeding it you know sometimes three or four males and you know a level of breeding that sort of happens um, and rarely does that happen in an aviary setup you know there's I'm aware of a few sort of breeders that have trialed it and they're getting some level of you know success um, you know not from a breeding perspective not so much from a uh, you know, behavioral, but you know, it's hard to know whether they get a behavioral perspective. Um, yeah. But um, but certainly, yeah, the, those species specific needs, uh, you know, we first of all probably we may not even be, we may be purely um, ignorant of them, <laughs> um, or we sometimes may just not know that, that no, not, not know them as well, or they can be incredibly difficult to recreate in yeah. an artificial or captive environment. Yes, yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, yes, very complex and, you know, it's, it's a very interesting topic and, yes, it's it's good to see, you know, I like that you guys are doing those, you know, skin biopsies and, and looking into that side of things and certainly there's more and more information becoming available which will make it, I hope, hopefully, you know, a little bit easier for us in the future to treat these issues and help people get on top of it. Because I also know from the human side of things, it's a very distressing behaviour for people to to mm -hmm. have to kind of cope with and um, work through. So, yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. I, I think certainly even and just having, um, I guess, Yuli and, and her life as well as being a lifesaver because you know we we already do spend a lot of um, time. You know, a lot of these consultations spend an hour just sort of even with the pre-consultation questionnaires going through things trying to sort of um, you know figure out what's going on and a lot of times we um, you know as avian specialists we don't have the capacity to go through sort of the the immense amount of experience sort of and the setup that you need to do sort of to um, behavior modification to actually address these issues and then having you need to go be able to go out, go to the, um, the client's houses and see the environment you know exactly sort of the setup that that makes a massive difference in the chances of successes so so as i said it, it sort of kind of you know circles back to what we were saying a little bit earlier i think um inevitably i see that um, our combined world sort of with upv sort of and, and power like are, are you know immensely useful because we are most likely to be able to get the best possible um, results for, for the, you know the family sort of parrots and pets that are having these issues yeah, I yeah I agree. I was very excited when you guys moved up near to me. So, <laughs> but you know, I think it's also you know we're seeing more and more avian vets all over Australia, and that's really wonderful because you know yes, it's these we can't resolve these issues on our own um, as behaviour consultants. Ninety nine percent of the time, it really needs that that holistic kind of integrative approach that we can we can reach through having those avian vets available as well. So, um, yeah, Mike Mike did add what he was really meaning, um, if feeding more vitamin A rich vegetables, et cetera, would be beneficial. Um, I, mean, I would say it can't hurt. <laughs> it, it, um, you, want, you want to, so that from a vegetable perspective, definitely fine, but from a concentrated supplement, um, I would not recommend that because some of, we are seeing, um, now, um, 
um, and there's some articles which show the effects of overnutrition. So having excessive vitam certain vitamins and minerals actually can cause some pretty detrimental um, you know, health conditions. You know, in the example of vitamin A, um, low levels of vitamin A actually cause very similar clinical manifestations as high levels of vitamin A. So, so you want to be really careful. In vegetables, you'll never reach that aspect. So vegetables, feed as much as sort of you want, it's fine, but just don't give them a vitamin supplement. That's sort of my, my advice or anything fortified heavily in vitamin A. Okay. Um, yeah. But is it, is it, is, do we have evidence that it is going to improve it? Unfortunately not. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, it's worth trying, yeah, increasing those vitamin A rich veggies, but there's, there's no clinical evidence that that's going to necessarily prevent that bird from engaging in that feather destructive behavior with the chicks. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Well, that's, we don't have any other questions. We've kind of, we've worked through the questions and we're just, just after 11 a.m. So um, we'll look at, I think, finishing up now, unless you had um, anything else you really wanted to add before we end the session. I know it's been wonderful. So I think we could probably talk about this topic for many, many hours and hours and hours. And hours. <laughs> um, it is, I said it, it is, it is fascinating. It's something I, I can see we're both very passionate about. And I think that it's, um, you know, we generally want to help these little guys because, um, you know, it, they can't speak to us, you know, they, uh, and, and there is a level of emotional suffering. I know we, anthropomize a lot from you know the human to the, the to animal stage but i truly um seeing these little guys less anxious um having a healthy emotional state makes a big difference and i've seen birds that come in and you know they're shaking and happy to birds that are become a lot more confident and and, and clearly happier in their environment so um so yeah so i i i think the more we can do for this, and, you know, the more people are aware of it and the more people act, I think the, the better it will be for all our parrot friends for many, many, many years. And I'm hoping that, you know, that maybe with um, the ongoing sort of management as we do this, that maybe we'll see a lower incidence of these, um, you know, behaviors, because it would just be, you know, while, while we both have a job from this, <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly, um, you know, we don't want birds to be suffering from these from these conditions by any means. No, that's it. I'd much prefer to come and work with people to teach their birds how to do fun tricks or you know how to how to interact with their new baby bird. Um, I, yeah, you know, I, I, it's really um you know hard seeing clients who are obviously suffering themselves because they're struggling with that, but also then to see the birds in those situations as well. And actually, something that I really really want to stress here as well is that. Um, it's important to understand that, you know, you're not a bad bird guardian if your bird is engaging in feather destructive behaviour. I can't stress that enough because I think that's certainly um, a lot of, you know, monologue that we have with ourselves when this sort of behaviour pops up that maybe we're terrible at it, maybe we shouldn't have birds, you know, we, you know, we're doing something wrong, we're hurting our animal um, and it can be very distressing. And so I really want to stress as well that you, you aren't a bad a bad bird guardian if your bird is engaging in feather destructive behaviour and it might not be a case of anything that you're doing that's particularly wrong. Um, there can be lots of different underlying causes and sometimes there's, you know, from my experience, it's often multifaceted. So there's a lot, you know, a couple of things that have kind of piled up and, and led to this behaviour in a lot of cases. So, um, yeah, don't don't beat yourselves up but certainly get you know jump on it and get that help straight away because the chances of resolution are so much higher um, in those really early stages yeah that definitely yeah i think yeah you, you're definitely not a terrible um bird parent or bird guardian by any means it's a it's a challenging it's a challenging condition it's and it is difficult and I guess that's why, you know, we have people like myself and Lee and other, you know, AV and AV veterinarians that are here to help as well and to you know, improve life for, for, your, for your bird and also for you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for joining us, Alex. We really, really appreciate you bringing all of your knowledge and skills and um, 
and expertise into this situation for us and having a chat about it. Um, thank you for taking an hour out of your Saturday for us. And um, otherwise, I hope you have a, are you, you working this weekend? No, no, I, I'm not. I'm no. having off, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Julian just asked a question and I'll, I'll, I'll ask it just purely because it's something else we talked about. She said, do wild birds feather destruct? Um, so, so generally, so, so, so generally, what we are observing is that uh, wild birds do not destroy feathers. Not, um, you know, uh, it's, it seems to be a behavior that is uh, from a captive artificial setting that we see. Um, you know, some of the birds that look like they might have feather destructive lesions often either have underlying disease states, either from you know viral infections. Um, external parasites, contamination with, um, you know, pollutants, things like that. We do see birds on this pull out feathers that have been um, covered with sticky residue and things like that in the wild. But generally, it's, um, yeah, un un well, unfortunately, it's a manifestation of the captive environment. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll finish up there again. Thank you so much, Alex, for joining us and uh, enjoy your weekends. Um, and hopefully we'll you know, have you on again at some stage to talk about maybe this again or something else. Ah, I absolutely love it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much, Lee. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. No worries at all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. Yeah. See you later, everyone.